Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, let us all stand and rise and sing and give praise to God. says, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, for praise, is from the upright and for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp, make melody with him on an instrument with ten strings. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth <coughs> is full of the goodness of the Lord. Yeah. 
Let's pray. God, uh, we are thankful to be here this morning to worship your name, to praise all the great things you have done in our life, how you change us, how you mold us to, uh, through the, your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that we would know this message, we would understand it, we worship and praise you for it, God. Change our heart, our mind this morning, pray for this offering, and guide and direct us as a church, and I pray that we would do everything for your glory. In Christ's name we do pray, amen. Amen. 
think that we as evangelical Christians, we love salvation, right? We love salvation. We love grace. We love forgiveness. We've read in the Scripture, and of course we've been told from the pulpit and told in Sunday school and Awana and on down the line, we understand that we are sinners and we were doomed and we were destined and we are condemned to spend an eternity in hell. And that is why salvation and grace is so exciting for us. What I want you to think about is this. We are indeed rescued from sin and death. We are saved from something. This morning I want to talk about the idea that we're not just saved from something, but we're saved to something. In other words, once we have received salvation, then certain things need to change. A little over 20 years ago, I can tell you the exact date and all that stuff if you're interested, but 20 years ago, I got married. And when I got married, I knew that there was a new standing and there was new responsibilities that came with it. Everything from making the bed in the morning to how I spend my money to start thinking about others rather than thinking about myself from what to eat every day. I knew that on that wedding day, from then on, things were different. And I think sometimes in the Christian life, we lose sight of that when it comes to salvation. We are so grateful that God has forgiven us, so grateful for what He has done in redeeming our souls from hell, but then sometimes we forget about the what's next or how we ought to live after that. Earlier in the book of 1 Peter, we learned about our call to holiness. God wants our conduct and our attitudes to be holy and pure and righteous before Him. There needs to be a fundamental change that takes place in our hearts and in our minds and in our attitudes and in our relationships and in our actions and with our purpose in living. Salvation ought to always impact our lives. And so in our passage that I'm going to read for you in just a minute, we're going to talk about three other ways in which salvation impacts our living. The difference that salvation makes on a day-to-day basis. And by the way, this, this doesn't end this week. We're going to talk about yet another way next week as well. Salvation is all-encompassing. Not just a rescue, but we are called to something different. Even Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, we are told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. This means we live out our salvation every single day day of our lives. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 tells us that God has saved us and called us 
with a holy calling. You see, salvation doesn't just rescue us, it changes us as well. And so that becomes our main thought for this morning. I don't want you to lose sight of that simple fact or those simple truths. We're going to look at three different ways this morning that salvation ought to impact our lives. And so even as I read 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 22, and I'm going to read into chapter 2, verse 3. So if you have your Bibles, I'd ask that you turn there with me this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. And I'm reading out of the New King James Version this morning. The Scripture says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Verse 23, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the Word of God which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the Word by which the Gospel was preached to you. And then verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious." Of course, as I started that passage, the first word that I read for you in the New King James in verse 22 is the word since. Obviously, that connects us with everything that has happened before. As we read that since, what is the big since? The since is salvation. Because we have received the salvation, therefore, here is how we ought to live our lives pleasing God to the Lord. He says, your souls have been purified when you've responded to the Gospel message that God has given to us. So salvation is there. Now how does it impact our life? And first of all, it impacts our life in how we love. That's our first point for this morning. Impacts us as to how we love. And specifically, what we read In verse 22, right at the end of that verse, it says, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Let me start with a quick definition for you. This biblical concept of love is self-sacrificing. Biblical love is a caring commitment that shows itself by seeking the highest good for someone else. Not self-seeking, not all about me, not about what can I get out of the deal, but it's always other-centered. Thinking about someone else. It's not about feelings. It's not about emotions. Biblical love centers on a love exercised by the will. I decide, not I feel all mushy on the inside. So we're not talking a sentimental feeling. Um, so much in, in what we hear and what we see in the movies and in literature and even probably at the high school level, you hear lots of people saying love, love, love. And I think most people have no concept what biblical love is all about. Some people think that love equals tolerance. And so Well, you should never tell anybody what they're doing is a bad idea because that's intolerant and therefore you must hate them. The world is all messed up in this whole idea because true biblical love says you see somebody about to do something foolish and sinful and destructive, then what should we do? We should warn them, of course. 
True love warns of the danger of sin. True love warns when other people are about to do something that will ultimately cause them pain. And so true love is, is handled, that situation, handled delicately, carefully, with compassion and tenderness and all that kind of stuff that is there as well. And so as Peter writes this word right here, he's saying, listen, hey, you people who are reading this, you know that you've been saved and redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Therefore, you guys are in special relationship with each other. You've got a special relationship because now you are brothers and sisters. You are children of our Heavenly Father and there's a special relationship that's there. Therefore, love one another. Some of the qualifiers that Peter puts in here so, so we could understand what brotherly love is all about. He, he says right here, love one another fervently with a pure heart. One of the things that he's talking about is being sincere. We're talking a genuine love, a love that is without hypocrisy. Not pretending, not putting a little smile on our face, on our face if, if we can't even stand that person. A love without hypocrisy. It doesn't pretend to be something it is not. Biblical love is not affirming and gushy to someone's face and then disparaging about that person when they turn their back. Biblical love is not manipulative, trying to sort of butter up someone for your own personal advantage when inside you really despise them. Biblical love doesn't try to use someone else just to make a connection or do something for personal gain. Biblical love is something where you go the extra mile because you care about them. Now, the New King James uses the word, and some of the other translations do also, uses the word fervently. Love one another fervently. Other translations might use the word deeply. We're talking the sort of love that goes the extra mile. It goes the extra mile even when you feel like you can't do it anymore. Even when you feel like you've put out and put out and put out you keep on going. The word that's used in the Greek is a word that's used to, to almost agonize, to stretch your muscles as far as they can do. It'd be like a running back in football getting right near the end zone and sort of stretching out or diving to get that ball to cross the plane. This is the sort of love that just reaches out and it keeps on going and going and going. Interesting enough, even as we look at these words, this sincere love and this, this fervent love, I'll tell you this, as we read these, we come to the very quick conclusion that love is something that needs to be worked on. Right? And this is, probably shouldn't sound terribly shocking to all of you, but love needs to be worked on. It's not just this, this natural thing that you have for well, I just love everybody in our church and I love everybody and sitting in the pews near me and with just natural love for one another. No, you read in Scripture that love takes work. It takes effort, especially as we deal with other people who, who let us down, other people who disappoint us, other people who've got their own sin issues too and maybe they struggle with pride or maybe they struggle with jealousy or maybe they struggle with something and maybe it just rubs us the wrong way. That is especially when we go the extra mile. When we work at something to get to the spot that we need to be at. The reality is if other people need to work at loving us, we need to be willing to work at loving other people. We're naturally sinful, selfish, fallen people. But get this, God has called us to be part of a family to accomplish His will here on earth. Therefore, we ought to figure it out. We ought to let some things slide. We ought to move forward and pursue what God wants us to pursue. And yes, it's going to be awful difficult sometimes, 
But we need to understand that genuine love, true love, sincere love, fervent love for one another starts inside of us and is something that is enduring. True love will last and last and last. Interesting connection here as you read through this, this passage as I just read a minute ago. And maybe as I was reading through, you're like, well, what is this? What is this grass and flowers and withers and dies? And what does this all have to do with what we're talking about here? And it's this. Peter is setting up a contrast. As he's writing this, he's setting the contrast so that we would understand that there's something huge, something called salvation, this imperishable seed of the Word of God which gets planted in our hearts and which changes us. And that imperishable seed of the Gospel of the Word will go on forever and ever and ever. And in the same way, this imperishable seed of the Gospel is going to give us something that will allow us to continue to love one another until the end of time. It is something that is absolutely 100% God-given because we can't do it on our own strength. We need the Lord to do it. But that is one of those things because it's born of God, it will last for ever contrasted of course with the grass it's going to wither and die the flowers are going to wither they're going to die flesh that lives here on earth going to wither and going to die but not so the word of god and not so the love that we would have towards the brethren this imperishable word of god produces something so profound in us that enables us to love. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but you you can't really separate because here's the the fast forward. Point three is going to be about the Word of God right here. And, And so get this. The love that we share or the love that we are to demonstrate towards one another is only possible because of Jesus coming into our lives and changing us and only possible when we have been filling our lives up on the Word of God. We can't do it apart from God's Word making a change inside of each one of us. So let me ask you this, because I also want to get down to the nitty-gritty, right? As we talk about stuff, I don't want you to think that, okay, well, he's talking, but I have no idea what he's saying or how do we implement this in real life because, you know, the reality is, I live with some pretty terrible people or I work with some pretty terrible people or it's really hard because people that I'm even in ministry with frustrate me, frustrate me at times. So how do we do this? And how do we move forward in loving one another? And I'll tell you what, the passage that we you know, look at in so many weddings and we, we talk about this sometimes and I don't know that I've ever preached on it officially, But 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is such a beautiful passage as it talks about biblical love. And and if you want to turn there, feel free, or else I've got the words up here, and I don't know if you can read it all again. This is the New King James, but let me just read that and sort of just briefly, not going into terrible detail, but briefly unpack this. Love suffers long. Long suffering. Other translations would use the word patient. So think about this in your own life. Think about this as you deal with with your spouse or with your neighbor, with the, the person that you serve with here at church, maybe the person on the other side of church. Is your are your dealings with that other person patient? Are you patient with someone else oh oh, how about this and is kind kindness is something that is so lost in our world today and what i say to people and i say this to my kids sometimes too is is it really that hard to be kind okay think about this is it really that hard to be kind to people and all of you should say well no it really shouldn't be that hard to be kind 
Well, why is it then that we can be so mean-spirited towards one another? We, we do not work at being kind very much. And so many people harbor grudges and anger and they're bitter and they're not patient and they are definitely not kind. This ought not to be so. It's something that should change when we become believers. It still takes work But God has given us that strength and that enablement to do something. So love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. It does not parade itself. In other words, it's not, hey, it's all about me. So many people get so self-absorbed that they're not even thinking about the other person. And so love doesn't behave that way. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. It doesn't think evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never fails. All of those things. Not emotion. All of those things are acts of the will. You need to make a decision, and you've got to work at it, and yes, it might be hard, and yes, it might even be your spouse, but we've got to work on it because this is what genuine biblical love is all about. And so we are called here to love the brethren. I want you to know this. God is displeased and our love is inadequate when we are impatient and unkind and not loving towards one another. Second point. We need to move forward right here. Second point. Um, salvation impacts our life in how we love each other but also impacts our life in what we are to get rid of in our lives. Let me say it this way. Salvation ultimately results in a new appetite or a different appetite. We now have an appetite for different things than we used to. Our improper eating habits are changed. And we've got something different and so we start out by what are we to get rid of look at verse one of chapter two he says therefore and how about this here again is a connecting word therefore tells us to go back and look why is it there he's talking about salvation and talking about the enduring word talking about loving each other very clear connection back there therefore laying aside now the image that's used is is talking about what you wear and as we read through the text we see that we are to take off certain things get rid of certain things that have been characterizing your life and some of the things that he talks about right here these are our desire for evil talks about malice and deceit and hypocrisy, and envy, and slandering other people. You see, we're told that when we become believers, all of these acts of the sinful nature, we're to lay them aside. We're to begin getting rid of them. So often, these are sins that dominate our lives. The word malice just means evil. And in this case, what we're talking about, because of the connection here, we're talking about the evil of hurting one another. We're talking about the evil of being unkind towards one another. We're talking about the evil of not loving one another like we ought to love one another. What Peter is doing is he is showing us that this sort of conduct for believers is not acceptable it is not acceptable for children of our heavenly father to treat each other this way and let let me say this my my kids mistreat each other sometimes they are unkind and they are hurtful and they are impatient with each other and as a father i'll tell you this as a father it grieves my heart it makes me sad when my kids are unkind when they don't get along And yet, I'll say this, my kids are 10 and 10 and 15 and 17 and 18. As much as as a father, it grieves me when I see my kids being unkind. I want you to put this in perspective. How our Heavenly Father feels when we are impatient, 
and unkind and when we mistreat each other. When we sort of try to puff ourselves up or boost ourselves up and start excluding other people. Think about how much that grieves our Heavenly Father. When we, as adults, are His children, and yet we shake our fists at one another and get mad and impatient and unkind with one another. Lots of things to unpack. We're not going to go into it all. Deceit, hypocrisy, envying, evil speaking, all of these. I do want to point this out because all of these things that are talked about in verse 1, these all deal with this horizontal relationship. By horizontal, I'm talking my relationship with other people is impacted by how I act. What's going to be interesting in just a minute, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about something different. We're going to talk about the impact of God's Word. And so get this, verse 1, dealing with relationships with one another. Verse 2 of chapter 2 changes the plane and instead of horizontal, now we're talking this impacts our relationship with our Heavenly Father. There's the, the vertical aspect as well as the horizontal because as we rid ourselves of certain things, the certain things that must be removed, now we are told that there is something to fill ourselves with. Get rid of the old junk, but instead fill yourselves with God's Word. Fill yourself with the Word that God wants you to do. Look at verse 2. As newborn babes, okay, just like babies eagerly want milk. They want that nourishing milk. They need it, and they're going to cry if they don't get it. In the same way, just like they desire that, we as God's children ought to be desirous of God's Word in the same way. What we need, I just want you to think for a second, there is, there's nothing so desperate as a baby crying because it's hungry, right? Okay, I remember those days when my kids were little and, and you'd get the wah, wah, wah. It drives you about crazy because you know that this child needs to eat. And some of you, I know, like run your children out of the sanctuary here because they need to eat and you want to get them fed or they're going to cry and disturb everyone else. And, and, and you know that when a baby needs to eat, the baby needs to eat, and you can't really placate the baby for very long. And so in the same way, our cry for God's Word ought to be just as intense. So don't fill yourself with the malice and deceit and hypocrisy and all those other things. Instead, be crying out to God for His Word. Fill yourself up with this nourishing milk of God's Word right here. Babies have a very clear focus. Food. We must be like them with a clear focus. We need God's Word. When I was in um, seminary, I was taking a preaching class, and there was a student in my class who was assigned, I don't know why they did this, but we were all assigned to preach a certain passage of Scripture. And so there was this one wild guy in my class who, who was a youth pastor at that time. And so I just remember him standing in front of the, the class, and uh, as he beginning his sermon, he uh, cracks open a can of Mountain Dew, just cracks the thing open, just good, 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 just drains that whole thing. Just, just about that fast, and he just you know, wipes his mouth and says, ah, that was great. And then he proceeded to, to preach on how much he loves mountain dewiness. He kept saying, mountain dewiness, oh, I crave the, the sugar and the caffeine and the mountain dewiness, and I just I want that for the rush that I get. And then, and then he kind of paused and slowed down. He says, you know what? But it's not something that I need. It's empty. There's no nutrients. Sure, I get the I get the rush and I get the sugar and I get the caffeine and I, I love the taste of it, but what good does it ultimately do me? And then, and then he pulled out like a little bottle of milk or carton of milk and he poured a little bit and, and drank that. And the whole point behind that is 
Yeah, well, the Mountain Dew might be tasty and fun and everything else. It doesn't do a whole lot for you, does it? It doesn't do much except maybe get you all wound up and can't sleep at night. But the milk is something that contains the nutrients. The milk is something that's going to stimulate brain development and it's going to stimulate bone growth. And, and the milk is something with all the nourishment and all the nutrients, it's something that's going to make a difference in the lives of not just little kids, not just babies, but adults as well. And our point here is this. Just like newborn babies, we also ought to desire the pure milk of God's Word. We ought to desire that. We need to have a desire for that. And so I want to move on right here because salvation impacts us on how we love, what we get rid of, and what to fill ourselves up with. But I want to share a few words about the Word that are used in this passage. First of all, take note of this. The Word endures forever. The end of chapter 1 spells that out very, very clearly. God's Word is what endures. It lasts forever. And there's a lasting impact from it. I read this and I love this. This is a quote from D.L. Moody. And he said this, you know, over 125 years ago. He said this about God's Word. He says, The empire of Caesar is gone. The legions of Rome are moldering in the dust. The avalanches that Napoleon hurled upon Europe have melted away. The pride of the pharaohs is fallen. The pyramids they raised to be their tombs are sinking every day in the desert sands. Tyre is a rock for bleaching fishermen's nets. Sidon has scarcely left a wreck behind, but the Word of God still survives. All things that have threatened to extinguish it have only aided it, and it proves every day how transient is the noblest monument that man can build, and how enduring is the least word that God has spoken. Tradition has dug for it a grave. Intolerance has lighted for it many a bundle of sticks. Many a Judas has betrayed it with a kiss, and many a Peter has denied it with an oath. Many a Demas has forsaken it, but the Word of God still endures. God's Word is powerful. Years ago, I came across another blurb. This was written by some guy named Anonymous, and he said this about, about the book, and maybe some of you have read this before. Um, but it's pretty profound. Talking about the Bible, it says this book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true. And its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. And practice it to be, to be holy. It contains a light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map. It is the pilgrim's staff. It is the pilot's compass. It is the soldier's sword. And it is the Christian's character. Here is paradise restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is the grand object. Our good is its design, and the glory of God is its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is given you in life and, we op- and will be opened in the judgment and be- will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility and will will repay the greatest labor and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Isn't that profound? and Pretty powerful and obviously (laughs) I did not write that myself. Point number two, word about the word. 
It ought to be craved in our lives. It ought to be craved in our lives, but how many people take the Word and set it aside? How many times do we implore you and entreat you and encourage you and beg of you, stay regular in God's Word, read God's Word. We need God's Word to be wise and strong and smart and everything else. We can say it and say it again, but then it comes down to you. That's each and every one of you making that decision, saying, you know what? Maybe it's not going to be easy, but I need to do it. We need to be spending time in the Word. This is this vertical relationship that I'm talking about. Our relationship with our Father in Heaven depends on our intake of God's Word. We need it. We need it. We need it. Psalm 119, one of the greatest psalms in all of Scripture, talks incessantly about the Word. And it tells us that the Word gives wisdom and the Word gives strength and the Word brings revival and the Word brings joy and the Word brings satisfaction and hope and wisdom and perspective and understanding and even brings us life as well. Point number three, the Word is pure. It is pure. It is not dishonest. It is pure. It is 100%. By the way, merchants in that day would often kind of dilute the milk. They wouldn't sell you straight up milk, but they would add water to it. They would dilute the milk by adding something to it. It wasn't pure, and they would do that obviously out of dishonesty. But let me tell you what. When you take the Word of God and you read it in its purest form and you allow God's truth just to trickle into your life you will be satisfied and i'll tell you what you read god's word and it will begin convicting you of sin it'll begin pointing out things where you have dropped the ball and let me say this too there are lots of churches where they don't take god's word seriously there are lots of churches that have such a low view on scripture but i'll tell you what god's word is our authority god spoke it we read it we can understand it and we grow because of that so the word is pure finally the word is nourishing i've already said that a whole bunch of times so it endures forever it ought to be craved it is pure and it is nourishing let me wrap up with this many years ago i was introduced to uh, the navigators have a, a seems a symbol for everything and so what we have up here in our next picture is many of you have seen that before this talks about methods of bible intake okay so maybe you're sitting out here and saying okay i understand yeah the word is important etc etc but but i want you to grasp this there are so many different ways in bringing god's word into your head and into your heart and the navigators years ago illustrate this by a hand I don't know who is the hand model for this right here. But, but they say that if you want to understand the Word, and this becomes our, our whole conclusion thing right here, first of all, we've got to hear God's Word. Thankful that all of you are here with us this morning you are hearing god's word maybe as you drive in your car or you're out farming in your combine or whatever you're doing it's my prayer that you are regularly being in a place when you can hear god's word being preached or spoken or maybe just straight up read we need to be there and that is so good just to have god's word come into our ears however it's even better not just to hear it, but also to read it. And there's studies that are out there that our minds grasp so much more when our eyes are actually reading it off of a page. So you can hear it. That's good. That's great, etc. But we also need to read it. And I'll tell you this, there are so many people that I talk to who would say things like, well, I'm not, not really much of a reader, so I don't really read a whole lot, and so therefore, I don't read God's Word either. <laughs> Let me just reiterate a phrase i've said so many times before god has given us a book and what do we do with books we read them this is god's way of communicating and maybe you're not a good reader and, and i'm sorry to hear that but i'll tell you what our god is so big that it doesn't matter how bad of a reader you are god can take those words 
and make it make sense to us. I'll tell you, there's sometimes that I'm reading and my eyes are looking at the words on the page and, and maybe I'm not grasping anything, but then my prayer is that, Lord, open the eyes that I might see the wondrous things that are there. We, we have a God who specializes in interpretation. He's the one who helps us understand. So hear it. Read it. The third thing is study it. Spend a little bit more time. Carve out some time. to Take a look and maybe in a lot of our Bibles there's cross references and maybe in some of your Bibles it's that little column thing in the middle and it'll have other Bible passages. Read a passage. Look and see another passage. Might talk about the same thing. Maybe get a commentary. Spend more time trying to understand what God's Word is trying to teach you. Listen, read, study it. The fourth thing would be memorize. And this is what our kids are going to want to do every single week. They're memorizing, getting God's Word into their heads and into their hearts so that they might know what God wants of them. So important for us to do this memory as well. And then the final point, and this is illustrated by the thumb, it's this whole meditation thing. We're not talking some Eastern religion guru chanting type stuff. When we say meditation, we're talking about thinking. We're talking about thinking and processing our way through. We're talking about doing a little bit of rumination, kind of regurgitating a little bit and then chewing on it a little bit more and, and sort of swallowing it a little bit and then bringing it back up. We're talking about thinking about God's Word throughout our day. As we interact with other people, as we're sitting alone, as we're driving in our car, we're talking about constantly barraging our mind with thoughts of God's Word and how He would want us to live it out. This is this whole meditation part. And again, in the picture that's here, that's back a couple of slides, is, is they show this hand. And you know what? This memorization or this uh, meditation part is the thumb. The thumb is what keeps it all together, all in grip. There was a man who years ago spent some time teaching God's word to me and discipling me. And he was going through this illustration of the hand. And he said, So try to hold the Bible with just these. Your four fingers without your thumb. And so I was kind of bouncing my, bouncing my uh, hand up here. <laughs> and he was standing right next to me and just quickly reached out his hand and smacked the Bible right out of my hand. I thought, where, where do you get off doing this, buddy? Anyway, his point was this. He said, you need that, mem the, excuse me, you need that meditation part because that's what holds it all together. That's what allows you to grip God's Word the most tightly that you need to grip it is by doing that, by holding on with your hearing, your reading, your studying, your memorizing, and then your meditating gives you that grip on God's Word that you need. So living out our salvation. Those are my challenges for you. Don't just be thankful. Absolutely be thankful in your salvation, but don't stop there. Continue to allow God to work in your heart and in your life. Let's pray this morning. God, our Father, I'm grateful that you brought each person here this morning. And I know that you have a word for each one of us. And God, I just pray that each person here would have heard that word this morning. God, I pray that we would be challenged to follow you faithfully and to live our lives for you. God, I pray that we would be diligent, even as we think about other people and, and maybe fractured relationships. God, I pray that you would give us that ability to let things slide and move forward and just to love one another the way that you would want us to. God, I pray also that we be diligent about ridding those, um, those vices from our life, that we'd get rid of the hypocrisy and the deceit and the slander and all those things that you want us to get rid of. And then God, I pray that each one of us would be diligent and faithful about bringing your word into our hearts, and into our lives. And so God, I do pray all of these things and ask your special blessing upon your people this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please join us for coffee and cookies in the other room.